Detroit is the greatest! Straight up light you on fire for a Coney dog right now. Thank you and welcome to another episode of the Motor City Sports Ramp Podcast. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Joining me, my longtime friend, Phil the Thriller Pamante. What's up, Phil? What up, John? Doc, we going to do this today or what, man? Yeah, man, we got everything set up, got the studio going. You know, the guys at the Motor City Sports Ramp, they're always busy. It's unbelievable. Jason, though, got to give him credit, doing a lot of great things at the radio station. He's actually right now doing his fantasy draft, he does a big thing. All Him and his boys, they all go up to like a lake house and they kind of all get together and do a draft. Not like just a couple hours. No, they make it a whole, whole day experience. Like week, yeah. A whole weekend experience. How big is the league? I think 10 to 12. Uh, that's a little... I, I'm more. I'm a bigger fan of the twelve team leagues now because eight to ten, anything lower than ten, you can get like super stacked teams. Twelve, you really got to have a good strategy going into the into the draft. So ten, eight to ten, you can get sort of lucky because there's such a wealth of talent. But once you get to twelve and fourteen, and so that's where it really starts to test your drafting abilities. You're my boy. I've known you a good twenty one years. Yeah. So let's let, let everyone int- let me introduce you to everyone out there in the podcast land. You're my longtime friend. I met you around you know early junior high, yeah, and yeah. it was a good time, man. I met you because you had a kick ass party, and I mean, w- <laughs> it's one of those things where you know you, I was more of a laid back guy. I went to school. I kind of did the whole study thing. All of a sudden, I heard there's a, there's gonna be a party with midgets <laughs> and beer, and I'm like, I'm 14, 15 years old. And I'm like, midgets? Who gets midgets? There was flyers. You had a boy named Don that was passing out flyers that were like... Dude, I remember my boy Don Friend took took it upon himself to invite four different schools from our area <laughs> over to my house. We had about 60 people in the place in about 20 minutes, and the cops came and shut us down. Yo, come knock on the door. Can we come in? I'm like, hell yeah. I'm like, get everybody out of my house, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was your way of like clearing the party. And this is like in East Point. So, you know, back in the day, we had a good time. So, you know, and then, then I went off to college. I went off to state. And the best times I had, because I was a guy that worked hard and studied and, and did a bunch of things to try to graduate fast. I didn't want to stay in college for six years and all that stuff. I was like, you know what? I got a job to do. I want to get a degree. When I knew you were coming to town, I was like, it's going to be a Dude, good time. And any, we, had, we had fun. Anytime, we, anytime that I came up there, we always had a riot. We, remember when we went to Raw at uh, the Breslin Center? Man? <laughs> or No, it, was, uh, it wasn't Raw, but we went to like this. Sunday night heat. Yeah. <laughs> so Phil would come up, and I thought I could have a good time, but Phil would be bonging beers. My roommates were like, who is this guy? This guy could drink us under the table. And they thought they were professional drinkers. You were like... This I just got started. Dude, when you got it in you, you got it in you. You just roll with it, that's all. You had a good time at state too. Oh, how, dude, partying up there is like I've gone I've gone to a few colleges, uh, you know, in the in the uh state and there's no party like a Michigan state party. Have you ever gone to Central? I went up to Central. There were, the parties are all right up there. Western's okay. I've never done anything down in Michigan because well, oh, Mich- it's Michigan, so. Yeah, you, <laughs> please. <laughs> Please. No, my first appearance, my first trip to the big house was with you and your bro. We went up to, we tailgated, and it was the game with Bobby Williams, and it was like, you know, a very low scoring game. It wasn't all that fun. Yeah. But I, I liked the big house. I mean, it was packed. It was a nice environment, but the tailgating is nowhere yeah, close. No, yeah. East Lansing tailgates are way better. Yeah. I mean, what did we go up to? What game did we go up last year for? Uh, we went to homecoming last year, yeah. and it was like, what, Colorado State, I think? Yes. And it was amazing. It was The vibe was great. We could drink in the morning, have a good time. Everyone's friendly. Mm, yeah. It's it's a good time. It's not too uppity. So you, wait, are you saying people in Ann Arbor are uppity? No, why would I ever say something like that? <laughs> Hell yeah, they are, man. <laughs> you know, we're going to talk today on this podcast. We're going to talk about the Lions. We're going to talk about Michigan and Michigan State's opening games. Yeah. Um, we're going to get a chance to kind of look at – what we saw in their early, our early impressions of what we saw in the first games. And it was quite interesting. Both sides kind of kept in line. Adam and I, when we did our podcast, we talked about what we expected and everything fell in line with terms of both Michigan State and Michigan. I was a little more disappointed in state than Michigan. Michigan, I really don't expect too much out of them this year just because of, 
you know, Harbaugh coming in, the situation that he's inheriting, but State with Cooks with Connor Cooks being involved in the offense as he has been for the past few years, I've expected a lot more against Western Michigan. So you expected more? What'd you expect? I didn't expect them to be to win that game by two. T- just uh, well, would they win thirty four? I don't know. He just he's he's never like super impressed me with his like presence in the in the pocket. I don't know what I. You're not impressed with Connor Cook? No, I, he, he's going to be. You know, he right now he's projected potentially to be a first round draft pick, maybe in the top ten. Pump the brakes, you think? It, you know who else was projected to be a top ten draft pick? And look what he's doing in the pros now, Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel Ooh. won won the oh, Heisman. Come dagger, on. bro, dagger. I know, I, yo, I know you're a state guy, but let's be honest, man. I don't, I don't know. Look at Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins is finally going to get his goal. I thought that they that the Redskins should have went with Colt McCoy over him just based off of last year's performance. Kirk's yo, Kirk's definitely better than than Griffin. But if you want if you want somebody to come out of state, you want a running back. Look at the running backs they've been producing. Langford's going to be something special down in Chicago because Forte's getting old. Le'Veon Bell, well, <laughs> he's just sick. So okay, so let's get into it. You're a big Michigan guy. You grew up in a Michigan family. Yes. But you're a big team, though, to let everyone know. You're a Florida State See. slappy. Oh, yeah. Tell everybody how you got into Florida State. Back in middle school, Charlie Ward, watching Charlie Ward, and that was it. I was I was completely sold on the program after that. I bought in, loved Peter Warwick, the national champ. They won the first BCS uh, championship, what, back when we graduated, I think, mm-hmm. back in 97. And that, I w- I've been sold ever since. Jimbo's come in, done a great job. <laughs> Not on the... Uh, up and up. Yeah, he he needs to regulate the kids a little better, but they're doing. He's doing his job winning football games. So you are one of those guys that are really super excited about Florida State. Your family, though, your dad, uh, it loves uh, Michigan. My my entire family is like Michigan to the extreme. They live and breathe them. I did when I was younger because you know you go you go along with the family. But as soon as I got old enough to like start developing my own ideas, it was I completely saw through the smoke and mirrors. No, shout out to your dad, because the best part about being a state fan is you want to have the, the other opponent, the opponents, and your dad, at that time, in the 90s, you got to remember, oh, Michigan was dominating yeah. state, and then I'd come over, and your dad would just lay into me and just be like, man, look at state, they're awful, they're never going to be good, and then you just take it year after year, and you get that one or two wins, and you're like super excited, uh, and you're like, oh, the first thing you think about, I'm going to rub it into <laughs> Phil's dad, be like, yeah, we won a game, and then all, then, 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 then when state would win, it would always be like something jerky, like the clock game, or like the, the game where the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, pa- the the pass interference yeah. that should have maybe been called, that wasn't called. So our wins weren't weren't legit. Then well, State turned it around. Uh, once well, Mark D'Antonio the, the, came to town, yeah, that's, that's a wrap. It's been, what, uh, pretty much a decade now that Michigan's basically been underperforming to their standards. D'Antonio's done an awesome job, but... What's been your pop's attitude with this whole last ten year run? Has he been like what? this? Pitch? You, now your you dad, know, your dad actually had a great time because he actually went out to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, he wa- he watched them win the national championship. Uh, what was it ninety seven? Yeah, yeah, back in ninety seven. So I mean, but what have they done since then? You, you know, he's a Michigan fan, but he's taken it with as best as he could because they haven't been worth it. Sh- yeah. So you can say it, they haven't been worth a no, shit. I, no, they haven't. I wonder with this Harbaugh hiring now, what it's going to do to how it's di- going to directly affect state though what do, what do you think about that all the it's actually better i think all the attention now is focused on harbaugh michigan state can do their they can handle their business without the glare as much yes michigan state is expected to go down and handle their business and compete for a national title yeah. but right now all the media coverage did you see the, if you if you peeked at the game versus utah when the game was done literally 80 maybe media members asking harbaugh questions yeah this is a guy that's polarizing. He's a guy that draws attention. So it's good because Michigan State can continue to handle their business and do their thing and let Michigan take they get to all fly the fly a little bit under the radar now. Uh, Michigan State's not flying under the radar anymore. But all the attention, all the scrutiny intensities is at Michigan side. I'm starting to think, look what happened when Urban Meyer came to town for Ohio State. What did they run off like 23, 24 straight wins before State took them down? I was kind of a little bit underwhelmed with Harbaugh's first first game. I thought he was a little bit I thought he worked with what he had. When you look at the big picture, the hiring of Harbaugh in mid-January really affected the talent that's on the team and really affected his ability to get the guys that he needs. Because look at the, look at look at what you have. You got a backup quarterback from Iowa what as the quarterback at Michigan. <laughs> Say that again. A backup, or you had a transfer from Iowa 
come to your university, a university that brought out guys like Greasy, brought out guys like Tom Brady, who are elite quarterbacks. Jake Rudock? Are you kidding me? The one thing about Harbaugh, and he's done this throughout his career, wherever he's been at, he is a quarterback's coach. Jake looked very, very shaky in that game, but it was uncharacteristic. They said, you got to think, these kids don't get too much in game. Like the pros, what, they get four games. Loosen up everything, go through the motions. Give Harbaugh some time with this kid, and they're not they're not going to be they're not going to be elite this year. But give him two to three years in Michigan. I honestly think, even though I don't like him, they're going to be competing for a national title. That's such a great talking point because that's what everyone's saying. Give him time. Give him time. The landscape out there is not as easy as it used to be to kind of rebuild your program. People are saying it takes two to three years to rebuild a college program to get your guys in there. Uh, remember. To, Michigan State's going to have another two to three years to get more talent. Oh. Ohio State, I, I don't think Urban Meyer's going anywhere. I don't think Urban Meyer's going to stop spreading the paper out there. Oh, Come well, on now. Yeah, here's the thing with State, though, okay? If we look at D'Antonio, D'Antonio's done an immaculate job of elevating them to a national uh, – to a national. when you thought Michigan State used to think about basketball, if we're being honest. Now, you look at State, State's a very powerful, powerful school across the nation. When is he going to win them a national title? Oh, that's that's, yeah. that's that's the, the next question. step. That's the question. I don't. I honestly don't think he can do it. He's had a ton of talent. There. What do you think about the game next weekend? Do you really think that even though Oregon's coming here finally, that they're going to be able to beat them? Because the way that game looked last night against, like I said, Western Michigan. I don't know, man. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're hitting no, a, no, you're, no, no, no response. Come on, man. No, I have a response. Um, my cousin Adam on our podcast, the Doc and Jock podcast, is like. Doc, pump your chest out. It's Michigan State. You know, go out there and say they're going to win. Go out there and just tell everybody that Michigan State is just the best and pump your chest out. Be be excited. Be all about Michigan State. But I'm more of a guy that's, you know, a Lions fan, a Spartan fan. So we're kind of used to disappointment. Well, yeah. So you can't just be like, I can't just fully let go and be like State is going to win it all. I look at the things that are, are the challenges for, for the Sparties and – you saw a little bit versus Western some of the wrinkles and some of the problem problem areas, and that's on the defense. You can't just lose your defensive coordinator who was really a guy that put in a great schemes, had the guys prepared week to week, and you can't lose cornerbacks to the draft. You know, Trey Wayans, De- Darquez Denard, they're yeah. gone. You lose your best linebacker in a, in a you know devastating – you lose them to a devastating knee injury. Those things can't happen, and you expect to just dominate and go undefeated. But yeah. You, but, bro, when, when I watch Fox Sports 1, when I watch ESPN, and they lay out that schedule for Michigan State, yeah, I get excited. I'm like, oh, my God, you get by Oregon. Yeah. If we can get by Oregon, it, it, they sh- it they, stacks up nicely to yeah. get to Ohio State undefeated. But when I broke down the season with my cousin, I said, I think that the, the games that are going to be challenging are Michigan, Ohio State, and Nebraska. I don't poo-poo going on the road versus Nebraska. I don't poo-poo Penn State. Just take it one week at a time. Now, looking at Oregon— um, to give you to give you the, the quick answer, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't think the defense is going to be where it needs to be just that quickly. Just because of how high high powered the offense is. Yeah, uh, our Oregon, they are able to they just, roll out yeah. great receivers, great routes, and that speed. Yeah. It's not that it's just the speed yeah, at which it's, they. It's tough to do because Michigan State's defense is predicated on getting pressure. The one factor that I am proud to say is going to really help is that the Michigan State has now an identity: the trenches. Massive offensive lineman, massive defensive lineman. Look at the run. You, look at the stats from the running game last night: one ninety six to eighteen. I mean, you win. And if you look at to last year's game, we were good up until the third quarter. If you limit those special plays, those chunk plays for Oregon, and you use the energy of the crowd, you know, I'm right now as we talk, I'm on the fence. I want, I want my week. Well, I want my week to look at it and, 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 and really, yeah. You know what? If they, like you said, if they can control the line of scrimmage and run the ball and grind the clock down, but I mean, that's. The Big Ten's always going to be the running conference. They're they're grind you out sort of guys. You're not you're not going to see too many. They're trying to implement some flashy plays, but it's just not it's not the style of the Big Ten. Let's hold off on Michigan State talk for just a minute. Let me get let me get amped up even more and talk more about it. But let's scale back to Michigan for just a couple seconds here. All right. Now you're looking at Michigan. People are on kind of a couple sides of the fence. Some people were actually very upset and angry because, and I'm one of them. I felt Michigan could have won that game. I'm not looking at look, – look, here's what, here's what people are doing. People are um, kind of trying to make excuses for what happened. I think that Jake Rudock 
potentially cost them that game. There's no question he cost them the game. That, those turnovers, yeah. Those, and some of them weren't exactly his it's, fault. The, 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 those route, that, the, the pick six one was totally his fault because he completely, under, he completely underthrew the receiver there. You also got to scale back to Michigan had great plays set up. Wide open receivers. You see guys wide open yeah. running, and you don't hit them. You're like, what's up, bro? Hit the open receiver. I, I was shocked to see that Rudock couldn't hit an open receiver and, and really cost it. He left like 21 points on the board. Do you think that's, that's just nerves, though? or I mean, like Ta- said, I think it's talent. Look what Harbaugh did with Colin Kaepernick. Let's be honest. Colin Kaepernick's a good athlete. He's not the greatest passer, but he, he can make plays with his legs. If Harbaugh's got a guy that can stay in the pocket, I think that there's he's going to be able to do some work with this kid. Like you said, they're, Michigan's probably going to finish at what eight and four. Oh wow, that's maybe 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 seven and five. Yeah, seven and five, eight and four is more realistic. Seven yeah. and five. That okay. that's something. I mean, they'll, they'll probably be in bowl contention, but I mean, whoop de doo. <laughs> yeah. What, what's I mean? What, no, I'm looking at I'm looking at it like I think that if you know you got a guy that was touted as being one of the great college coaches, a great NFL coach. I felt like, and he said it himself. He he was. I, I felt like the game plan was too conservative. You know, the dink and dunk. They they had and look look what you had. You had two guys out there, Jake Butt and Darbo, over six catches each. Uh, I think Nick Butt had around ninety five yards and a touchdown. Darbo had over a hundred yards and a touchdown. Those guys were great. I think if you had a quarterback that could get them the ball, the offense could be a little bit more farther along. And guess what though? Here's the best part: Shane Morris had no touchdowns. Shane Morris can't beat out Rudock. What's going on with that? Well, I mean, look what happened to him last year. They threw him. They put him in in a bad situation. That's like comparing putting Cam, Cam uh Cam Newton down in Carolina right now. You know, I know I'm crossing borders, but their offensive line's horrible. Horrible. You can't throw somebody into that and Cam Newton's a great quarterback, but he's going to have a rough year. You can't put a young kid like Shane Morris in that in that situation and expect him to thrive there. Michigan's got to do a good job this year. They've got to get a big win. They need to they need to beat state or I don't know how beat Ohio State. They have to get a big win because it has to impact this next recruiting class. Okay, so you're uh, along the lines as to what some people are saying is that give Rudock some time. He will be that guy that holds the ball, will make some better throws, will progress under the tutelage of Harbaugh. Dude, Harbaugh is going to do wonders. He will. This kid will not be benched. It's going to have to get terrible, and I don't think he'll even do it then. He's going to have his back. He is a, he's a, that's why he left the NFL, because he's a rah-rah guy. He knows how to motivate these kids. Those guys, the pros, they don't give a shit about that, man. These young kids, though, they get amped up about that. If he gets him, if he gets him to buy in, they're gonna. He's gonna be able to do something with him. You're 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 along the lines of hey, it's his first year. I'm patient. I'm along the lines of man. Michigan pa- Michigan's blown for ten years. Let's go. Let's pa- oh, pa- look you because because you've seen Urban Meyer. He came in there with rah rah undefeated seasons, even though they were on talk, probation. Talk about yo. Let's look at their schedule. Well, you, well, Utah. Come on, they were not ranked. They're good, solid, but no. I, that's I'm a game. Ta- that, I was talking about. I was talking about Ohio State. Yeah, but their schedule, dude. He's had some pretty easy. Mm-hmm. He's had some fairly easy schedules, if we're going to be honest. So yeah. you've got to look at Harbaugh. Just his mentality. He comes in. He's aggressive. You know, which could be the reason, like you referred to about him, the conservative uh, play calling. But Michigan's going to get there. It's just going to take them a little time. I know you. I know you want some, but you're not. A, you're not a Michigan fan, so neither am I. But I'm. I can be more unbiased about my like okay. expectations. The, the the last point with Michigan is some people are starting to say, okay, we understand that really we're not in the league of Ohio State. No, Michigan's not anywhere near no. that quality. Do you think it's more important than this year to compete versus Michigan State, or is it more important to compete versus the big rival for Michigan, Ohio State? Well, they should be able to compete with both of them if they want to. Uh, I, I know it's not going to happen, but they need they need to worry about state. I think he can come in and do a good job recruiting in the state of Michigan. So that shouldn't, you know, state's going to pull their recruits. But if he really wants to make a splash on the national level, he ha- they have to have a good game against Ohio State. They can't get run over. He has to come in and they have to put up a good game against them if they want to compete nationally. You're now taking the attitude of it's time to put up or shut up for Michigan State. Yes. You're saying, oh, yeah. You're saying, your opinion is, Mark D'Antonio and the program kind of has plateaued, and it's time for them to take that next step or, or what? Or honestly, they have to move on. I, he's done a great, he has done a great job of building that program into what it is. They're, uh, they're a national Move on. <laughs> Look at you. Well, hey, what, when are they going to win it? When's he going to win a title then? 
How many years do you, how many years do you wait? How, okay. how much time do you give him? Now, this is one of the things where you got to look at history. This is Michigan State. Yes, back in the day, they were competitive for national titles, but the landscape now is totally, completely different. You got to deal with the SEC. You got to deal with Uncle Urban over there at Ohio State. The landscape is totally shifted. It's not that easy, but he can do it. This year sets up. Why are you being so soft on your boys? You're hard as hell on Harbaugh in his no, first no. year. You know, Harbaugh lost his first two uh, yeah, col- okay. debuts, and look what he ended up doing at, right. at San Diego State. Harbaugh hasn't won a national title. It, it takes True. a special. It takes you know what. It takes everything falling into place, and you have to have talent. And Michigan State gets Michigan State. What they do is, and I'm proud of them for doing it. Is they get guys that are like maybe three and four star guys, and they pump them up to be productive guys. Oh, guys like Ohio State, they start off at five star, you, you, and they go and to you higher know levels. Why, and you know Come why that is? That's because of the name brand. Michigan yeah. is a name brand. Stanford, yo. He did an awesome job at Stanford, but let's be honest. Stanford's more about the academics. Stanford's the fact that he elevated them to where he did is an amazing job. But you get a name brand like Michigan, people recognize you put the Michigan Wolverines, you put that logo, the gold M out there, the yellow M, people recognize that he's going to draw some big recruits and he will put them in a spot to contend for national title. Now, D'Antonio's built a program up when I don't want to hear, oh, he, oh, he's, you know, he's doing a good job. No. When do they compete for a title? It has to be this year then. Then this is the year because the schedule shapes up nice. You got a big game at home yep. at, uh, you know, coming up this week versus Oregon. It's a home game, so that's good. Yeah. But going on the road to going, uh, going on the road to Ohio State, how are you going to sit there and say, and now when you look at it today, Look how monumental that win was versus Ohio State that broke that streak for, for them. Yeah, and Michigan State it's beat huge. them. It, it, it really at the time maybe we didn't really understand the the importance. Yeah, yeah, went out there and beat Ohio State. Now can you do it consistently? Psh, that's a tough part. But this is the year to do it. You got a great offensive line. You got two running backs that can handle the, handle the deal. The question marks are going to be, can the wide receivers and the corners kind of step up and and play better? And can the, the defense, defense in general? Yeah, the defense ooh, has got a. Yeah, the special teams was <laughs> atrocious in the first quarter. Yeah. I mean, and the defense has to step up. They can't get gashed like that. But if you're going to go out there and state a goal of winning the national title, they're doing it the right way. Big, huge, big, huge lineman, uh, experienced quarterback, and a solid defense with great defensive ends. I mean, Shalik Calhoun can handle it, can bring it every week. Here's the part that is a little bit challenging, is that you got to have things fall right for you. And sometimes with Michigan State— yeah, you gotta get you got to get it, some breaks. yeah. Some teams have gone into, you know, the BCS in the past with one loss. loss. Yeah. Michigan State, I don't think, is afforded that cachet in that if they lose to Ohio State, oh. and knock, it's, it's going to be probably an elimination game. And, but I would like to have the chance. I think if Michigan State got into a playoff, if there was an eight-team playoff last year, they might have had been one of those teams that could have risen up and, and peaked at the right time in a playoff situation. But in a, the tough part is only four teams. Well, four and, teams. And that's the problem. With, but this has been the problem with college football in general since it's – inception or when the polls started to take precedent you can't rank these teams based off of their schedules like ohio state's schedule is super soft this year it's basically a joke what what team they have what one nationally ranked opponent and that's state and but state's going to play oregon you know at home they're going to go on to ohio state on the road you know a little better about their schedule who else do they got to play they got, you know, Nebraska, Penn State. Okay. There's some and, cupcakes in the middle. And, yeah, but those those games are legitimately tough games, exactly. too. So, you know, the basing these uh, rankings off of, like, the, what, who, yeah, the what, win, the qual- where's the quality win then? Like, Florida State was undefeated the entire year last year and was praying to sneak into the playoff. Undefeated in the A in the AC, I know the ACC is not like a power school, but how many teams were in the top 25 in the ACC last year? I know off the top of my head there was four, mm-hmm. and they beat all of them. So, and they were the defending national champion. What, in your mind, is a fair and reasonable they, way of they, settling it? The, uh, the eighteen playoff eight, is the best. Is the best way they've got. I understand that the Bulls don't want to give up all that money because, well, <laughs> they're getting paid. Cha-ching. Yeah, and I mean that's. Let's be honest. Look at the Ed, Ed O'Bannon situation. Yo, college college sports is all about money. That's it. You asked me before the season started what the record for Michigan State was going to be. I said ten and two. I have them losing to Oregon and Ohio State. Okay, so I'm, I, I go with the attitude now as a sports fan of 
set the expectation low and be super excited yeah. and, and then to set it super yeah. high and, and be it, ultimately uh, devastated. Yeah. I think it's actually a safe way to go when you're a guy like me in the position I'm in, being a Lions fan and a Sparty fan. You can't, you can't, how am I going to pump my, I don't understand how my cousins like pump your chest out. I went to Michigan State with John L. Smith. We were bent over by Michigan year <laughs> after every, year yeah. after year. You had a pretty uh, rough, you had a pretty yeah. rough up in your I'm four-year not, tenure, I'm, man. I'm, yeah, now I'm, I'm like still, I think, in shock that I watched State win the Rose Bowl. I watched State go out to, to bowl games four years in a row, get down by 10 points, and come out and win. That Baylor win was huge, bro. Oh. Huge. I watched great memories of them, you know, beating Stanford at the late games. I mean, the, the games haven't been easy to watch. They've been stressful. So now we can sit here and say, yeah, State's got all the pieces in place. And Mark D'Antonio, is a, and as a psychologist, I'm thrilled. He's a master psychologist. And co- all coaches have to be. And he gets the guys motivated and uses anything he can to kind of pump the program along. But for Michigan State, you got to know your place. This is a year you come and you bring it and you see what happens. But that it's just I wish they would have put the Oregon game maybe yeah. a little bit later in the year. Well, yeah, especially as sort of rough as a rough Second around the edge. Yeah. yeah, home I, opener. Yeah, it's, it's tough. That's a really really tough matchup. I mean, to be if you're, a, being ca- this, you're being cautious, which is which I is ask you this, knowing knowing how the playoff was before before uh, how the BCS was before the playoff. When a team would lose early, did they, when if Florida State would lose an early game or get upset, yeah. would, would that bug you and just be like, kind of take the luster off the season? Because you knew they weren't really playing for much other than to see yeah, how yeah, players would progress. Yeah, not, you, not much. Yeah, if you lose, if you lose in the beginning of the year, it's basically and depending on who you lose to. Now, M- Michigan State, if they should, if they should lose to Oregon, they can still be in a good spot to rebuild throughout the rest of the year. I mean, look what Ohio State did; they lost to Virginia Tech and somehow snuck into the playoff last year. So what, so, th- so what do you think about my Spartans? Honestly, I'm looking at them. Yeah. if the defense plays a little better and Cooks surprises me a little bit, they should be 11-1. and one. I think they win at or- they can win at home versus Oregon, but going on the road to Ohio State, forget about it. So, I mean, you almost want to lose to Oregon because then you have a chance to build up. Because the SEC, they're just going to beat the – they're going to beat each other's brains in. Let's take it. We'll, we'll take a quick break here, pay some bills, give a shout out to some of our sponsors. We'll come back. We'll talk about some lions and your fantasy football tales and maybe some uh, poker stories too. <laughs> uh, Stay with us on the Motor City Sports Rant, Detroit Sports Podcast dot com. Doc here for FanaticU dot com. Go check out Detroit's official sports outfitter, FanaticU dot com. They got great Pistons gear, wings, Tigers, Lions, and now that the college football season's starting, you gotta you gotta represent. Me and Phil, we go tailgate all the time. We love tailgating. We love having a few cocktails. But I'm always rocking a great Sparty hat, great Spartan gear. He's always rocking the bright red Florida State gear. But go to FanaticU.com and represent. And if you shop online, use the promo code DSP, and you can save 15% off your entire order. Check frequently. There's always clearance items. Use promo code DSP. You get another 15% off even clearance items. FanaticU. Dot com promo code DSP Detroit Sports official outfitter and now back to the Motor City Sports Rant on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Godfather's in the house. Thanks everyone for downloading this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podomatic the DetroitSportsNation.com website. We want to thank everyone that supports us. We can't do this project without the support of everyone that listens, that clicks through the banner links at our website, that downloads and tells someone. That's how we grow this thing. I just have the opportunity to put out podcasts four to five times a week. And if you like what you're listening to, you hear you know Doc and his boys rapping about something that you really like, tell someone, and that's how we grow this thing. Word of mouth. Love it. What do you think so far? How do you what do you think about I'm this whole deal? This. this is fun. I, it's fun. You know, I thought I was going to be a little nervous, but it's like we're just basically doing what we do, man. We get together, you know, have a drink, talk. We talk sports. It's, I mean, it's same old, same old. That's exactly the vibe I wanted to create. Was just, you know, I'm going to go to the bar, throw a couple back. I want to chat sports with the boys. This is what we do. We just would ask these questions. We chat. Now it's a little bit more, you know, sophisticated with the gear, yeah, with and the, the gear, and, but and the periscope yeah, yeah. and the videos. What up, Internet World? <laughs> but this is what we do. We rap sports, and that's, what, that's the vibe I wanted to create, and I'm happy to have you here, bro. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, let's talk a little about your fantasy, bro, because I've been playing in fantasy leagues with you for a long time, and you're all about it. You got the sheets. You're prepared. You know. You got, and, but I have a question, though. 
I do leagues differently than you do. You like keeper leagues. You like auction drafts. I'm more conservative, See, standard ESPN. You're all into auctions and keepers and all that. Why? 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 You, yeah. Why you? Into, well, why you like like that? Here. The thing with the snake draft, the ordinary snake draft is has nothing to do with your planning. Okay, nothing. It's all about luck of the luck of the draw, where you get situated in the draft. You get the first pick, you get the twelfth pick, you get the sixth pick. It doesn't matter. You can create a strategy strategy effectively off of that. But when you get into drafts like my auction draft, I have to. It's not only about me. It's about what everybody else around me needs and how I can limit them in certain ways to getting what they want. I just had my auction draft, what, two weeks ago now? And I ended up getting Jonathan Stewart, Amari Cooper, and Ryan Tannehill. And all three of those were my big targets, just based off of all of the analysis that I had done. That was going with the starting lineup of Jeremy Hill, DeMarco Murray, Jordan Matthews, Odell Beckham, and Deshaun Jackson. So to start, I had a pretty decent starting five right there. And then I get to add a little depth with Amari. I get a starting quarterback. You know, I get an, and I get a, I get another running back who he's my boomer bust this year. Okay, so you're saying that doing uh, an auction draft it gets you to do a little bit more prep, and you feel oh, like you're, you know a little bit better and how to value these guys. So t- t- take me through it because I've never ever done an auction. How much? What's the cap? Well, well, here's the thing: does every league set it differently? Yeah, yeah, it's a little different. Now I know mo- most standard auction drafts are they give you about two hundred bucks. So. Whoever, depending on league finish from last year, some guys start one through, uh, whoever finished first, some go through last. What we do is we go through last, we get $110 million, okay? Set up a little differently because it also, we also do it through uh, the auction through free agency. So you get $110 million, you get to keep five guys uh, and up to $55 million. So you get to keep half your room. I got to keep, like I said, I Jeremy Hill, DeMarco Murray, Odell Beckham, Jordan Matthews, and Deshaun Jackson. And it cost me about $53 million. We base those off of points, you know, yardage, touchdowns, et cetera. By doing the auction, you get to give yourself a chance to really analyze and look at what you need and how you can go about getting it at the best value. Like, I basically hit a home run last year in getting three of the best rookies in that class. And they came out and produced... I wanted Kelvin Benjamin, but I couldn't afford him, so I had to let him slide. But he's on the he's on the injured reserve already this year, so it looks like I did a pretty good job. Now, what's been your success? Because every time we chat, I'm like, oh, I'm I, even. It, 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 wouldn't be, it wouldn't be success. I haven't, unfortunately. Have I've you ever won a league in any? Season? No, no, I, never. I've, the last two years in this league, and I've done some. Like I said, I thought I did a pretty good jo- job drafting. I got off to two and six start two years ago and one and seven. <laughs> now I won the, it's called the NIT championship. It's basically like the toilet bowl, like the top six go to the playoffs and the top six fight it out. But I won the bottom prize, which was basically break even money for, for the year. Rough starts I'm losing games by Dal- the Dallas new Orleans game. I'm rolling because DeMarco had huge game, huge numbers. Dell scores that touchdown late in the fourth quarter. I'm up six points. Jimmy Graham comes back and gets uh, 40 yards receiving, and I lo- I end up losing by two points. That's the kind of – but that's the thing with fantasy. It's You can do all the right things drafting-wise, but catch a little bad luck and – The same story goes um, – it's quite interesting. In your gambling career as well. <laughs> oh, we've, we've sat at, you know for lots and lots of hours at the poker table, and I've seen some things – I've never seen a guy take as many bad beats as you, and I'm not gonna lie. You know, you have you have the uh, you have the flush by the turn card, and then boom, the guy fills his full house. It's kind of it's pretty sick. You've taken some bad beats. How do you deal with all that, man? You you you're you're into it. You're competitive. I quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I I really have not played poker. A, yeah. I well, finishing up my degree mm-hmm. sort of cut into my free yeah. time, but I I took a I took a break from poker because just well, the more math that I got into. Oh, by the way, folks, I finished my degree at Wayne State. I got my bachelor's of arts and mathematics with an actuarial uh, science concentration. I'm studying to be an actuary, so this plays heavily into my fantasy football drafting because of all the statistical uh, research I do to like back my my analysis, but. With poker, there's huge, huge swings, and I'm not in the greatest shape financially to be able to deal with those swings. So you got to know when to cut your losses, right? Yeah. So when are you going to quit fantasy? <laughs> no, that, that will never I'm, happen. I, I, how, many, know, how many leagues are you rolling into this year? I'm just in three this year, but I, I like you said, once I get back, once I get back to work, 
it's all over next year. I told my wife, I'm like, I'm going to, uh, the sky's the limit. I honestly want to be in at least 10 leagues next year, if at all possible. 10 leagues? Doesn't that affect like your love of football? Like watching, like, you know, no, I, you, you know why? Because I've got, I'll have there, I'll have so many people on so many different teams. Then I'll actually just be able to, I won't be able to root for or against anybody. I'll be able to fantasy is, I know it has a uh, detrimental effect on some people's love of the game, but for me, it like watching the numbers, tracking the stats and just, it, it makes you really tune into the game. You have to watch who's playing who their matchups. It's, I don't know. It's, it's been enjoyable for me. How long have you been playing fantasy now? Yeah, it's been a good, good 10 years. I haven't had no success. I think I've maybe got second place three, four times. That's about it. I mean, I'm, I do about two or three leagues a year. I start off good, usually with the draft, pretty consistent. But then when the play, I usually make the playoffs. Sometimes I don't. But when I get to the playoffs, it always seems like I'm exiting early because, you know, I, I, the late season moves, I don't really kind of pay attention to as well as I probably should. Like my Andrew Luck uh, loss last year in the playoffs with the zero point. Uh, yeah. Th- thanks, by the way. Yeah, so you really – and so now this year, I did a little bit, little bit more studying in terms of the second half of the, of the season schedule yeah. to see who's playing who and who are guys that are playing like the weaker opponents, uh, you yeah. know, per- perennially. perennially. So you know, kind of, if a team's playing Oakland, if a team's playing one of the bottom two, yeah, Jacksonville, Jacksonville. Yep. You know, kind of, you need to have team, players on there for the playoffs. Strength of schedule is such a huge, huge tool that is probably really, really underused, underutilized by most like of your so-called regular fantasy football players. Carolina has the easiest playoff schedule for uh, running back and the easiest schedule for running back. Jonathan Stewart's basically, if he can stay healthy. He's in shape to have statistically a great year. So I, I own him in all three of the leagues that I have too, by the way. Now let's segue a little bit into the Lions. Bro, how shocked were you? We went 11-5 and five last year? That's I wasn't, heard of. I, I, I was not shocked at all. You mm. want to know why? Caldwell got a really, really bad rep out of uh, the, Indy, the Indy situation. You lose Peyton Manning and you expect the guy to succeed at all? Let's let's be realistic here. There no, was... I do I do agree that the Peyton Manning loss was significant for sure. But what people started to notice was he's a consistent coach, but the finer, the fine points of coaching, there was a little bit of weakness in terms of clock management. Some choices that he made, you know, really upset. And there's a classic video with Caldwell with Peyton Manning looking at him like, Why are you calling timeout versus the Jets? You're giving them extra extra time to make the play. And so people were like, Okay, this is a guy who's a good coach. Good. Yeah, but to be elite, you don't think he's gonna? He's not know, Belichick, so that that that's the guy you always look to the best. He's not Belichick. I want Belichick. Well, damn what, it! Uh, what, what, what is what's the? If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Oh yeah. Hey, oh, we'll talk about that. We'll definitely talk oh, about yeah, Tom we, Brady <laughs> for sure. I'm sure we'll get to that. But with Jim Caldwell, you know he's a guy that's solid. He's a guy that's gonna ha- put a program in and have the team playing well. But is he going to take you to that next level? I just don't see it yet. I don't see a guy that's going to take us to consistent playoff wins year after year. Look at Belichick. You have one down year, boom, the next year, two, three playoff wins, you're in the Super Bowl, four rings. Come on now. I don't see that. I want that guy. But where the Lions are at, I'll take it. I honestly think that the Lions, the Lions' biggest hurdle is Green Bay. They get, if they can get past Green Bay this year on the road, they win the division and they get that so much needed home playoff game. That is vital. If the Lions get a home playoff game, I guarantee a win in that home playoff game and get them on in the divisional round. Now, bro, I know everyone's soured on Jay Cutler and the Chicago Bears, Chicago's. but John Fox is no joke. He's a guy that, that maybe not this year, but you give him a couple years, get his guys in there, get the system rolling. He's had success everywhere he's gone, so don't sleep on the on the Bears. Nah, you know what? He might. He I, might. I'm more worried about Minnesota. AP's yeah. back after you're off and he's healthy. Teddy Bridgewater's got a little more, you know, got a little more wind under his sails. They picked up Mike Wallace. They got Charles. Charles Johnson is huge, hugely under under the radar receiver. He's he's someone you might want to take a look at fantasy wise. So you're thinking that the Lions potentially this year can continue that success after oh, Sue's absolu- gone? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, come on, bro. You think the Lions are going to have success you know this year? More than eight wins? More than eight? Yeah. You really don't. I have made eight. No. No, they they I they should be ten and six at least. I I've got to look at the schedule a little better. But who, we start out at San Diego. San Diego should be a win, even though they're on the road. Who do we play next? I think I think it's Minnesota, then uh, Denver, Seattle. No, Tough. Seattle, Seattle, Denver. No, De- they're Denver. winning at they're winning at home against Denver. Play. So oh, ten and six. Wow, you 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 kind of have bought into what's going on with the program I like, change. I like I like Caldwell. I honestly think that if they would have gave him a little more time. 
if he would have been there with luck, they they would have. Oh, they would have been oh, in the Super Bowl within a year, within two years. Yeah, luck would have made Jim Schwartz a good quarterback. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, Schwartz, nah, Schwartz was a jerk, man. He wasn't going to make it. So, wow, I'm I'm quite shocked. Uh, you know, watching the Lions for so long, you notice that they have a little bit of inconsistencies. They lost yeah. their best defensive player. Stafford is a big question mark. Stafford's always a big question mark. He he does what, some things. Did you take the next step this year? Next step, I mean, the kid's thrown for 5,000 yards twice in his career. I mean, what else do you want out of him? Oh, dude, he's a great fantasy guy, but I'm talking about a guy that's going to get you yeah, playoff wins. Yeah, playoff yeah. wins. Next step meaning yeah, he, a run yeah. in the playoffs. Yeah, and that's what I mean. They need they need to have that win. Green Bay, the win against Green Bay on the road is the make or break for them this year. If they don't do that, they're not going to win the division, no home playoff, and no playoff win then. So you're thinking potentially that the Lions are going to continue this success despite the fact Absol- they lost their best player? Absolutely. You don't think the loss how, – how devastating is that loss of Sue? Well, you can't you can't replace him, but they went out and tried. Haloti Nada is – since I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan, Baltimore's had an awesome defense for years. I, Ozzie Newsom's a great GM. You can't ever question his his movements or what he's thinking, so – Cutting if he cut Nada, he did the right thing. If he looking out for the long run, but Detroit picking him up, I know Halati's a little older than everybody would like, but he's going to come in and fill a hole that they much desperately needed, and they didn't address too well in the draft. The defense, I think, the defense is still going to be just as good as last year. Yo, know, I mean, Sue- yeah, Terrell Austin, surprising. He's a surprising coach, and he's a guy that's getting attention potentially be a head coach. Yep, I'm yeah, very surprised. I, he's doing a good job. Look at uh, look at uh, Bulls. You're seeing a lot of these good defensive coaches now. They're taking they're taking the talent around them. Arizona's defense last year was decent, but besides Patrick Peterson, I don't really think that they were like as elite as what they were coached up to be. I think that Detroit's defense is still gonna be gonna keep them in a lot of games. Stafford, if Stafford limits the turnovers, we start run. They got to run the ball better. They have to. Either Amir Abdullah eight, comes yeah, in, yeah, and Joe Amir, Drake Bell. I think that's a good combo right yeah, now. Yeah, Amir should. I think that Amir should be the the first and second down back, and then they should have Joykin on third down, just because of it. he can a little more power, but he also catches the ball a little bit. Amir is still working on it. His hands are a little questionable still. So, a little bit of talking points regarding the wide receivers is should Golden Tate get a little bit more of the touches this year than Calvin? Because you see, when you look at look at the Lions offense. When you have a guy like Calvin, you're going to target him. He's big, he's strong, fast, can get open. But Golden Tate's a little bit more productive. All you got to do is yeah, get Golden catch. Tate. Hey, all you got to do is get Golden Tate in a little space. Hey, if he can, if he can get open and they get him into some space, yes. House, but some house. people, some people are just so adverse to openly talking about the fact that hey, Calvin's a little bit older. He he he's, is a little yo, older. He, he's and he's to, missed games. Yeah, and you saw last year when when Calvin was out, uh, Golden Tate. Was huge production, big numbers, huge production, good numbers, and and the lines were competitive. And then when, when you think that when Calvin came back, it would continue to flow. It just seemed like it bogged down the offense, yeah, and it made it weird. It made it awkward. Stafford's probably a little more comfortable with Calvin just because of their relationship and how long they've been together. So, but this year, especially since Lombardi's in his second year as OC, I would hope that you know Golden gets like you're, he's not going to get. The 100 catches, you know, he's not going to have one of those years. But if he can get into, like, the 80 catch range with about 1,200 yards, because he he, he does so much after the after the catch yardage-wise, that that's something realistic. Now, looking at the league as a whole, I'm loving Indianapolis. I'm loving them to kind of take that next step. I know that New England and teams like that in the AFC are kind of the gatekeepers, Pittsburgh, and, you know, teams like Baltimore who are consistently, you know, up there and get to the playoffs and have success. But I like I like Andrew Luck taking that next step and the additions that they've had now, potentially. Yep. But people are saying, you know, that defense maybe is not the best. They're a little bit – they got pieces that are a little bit older. They've added age. But Andrew Luck, I think, is poised to take that next step and, and maybe get them to the Super Bowl. And Andrew Luck is a great quarterback. All the points you made, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose to the team that uh, for me to watch in the AFC this year. It's Miami. Ryan Tannehill has you too. Oh my oh, god, uh, bro! Come on, yo! Ryan Tannehill has sl- steadily increased his production over the last few years. They bulked up the D. They went got out. And got, they went out and got him a bunch of weapons on offense. Look, they went out and signed. Um, they got Jordan Cameron at tight end. 
They signed a couple. They signed Kenny Stills, a receiver. Jarvis Landry. Jarvis Landry is another wide receiver who was with that exceptional freshman class that came out last year. He's another receiver that sort of fell under the radar. Miami has all the makings to dethrone New England this year. Oh, okay. Finally, uh, Deflate Gate is over. over. Yeah. Well, technically, it's over. Yeah. Te- yeah. The NFL is going to appeal it to save face, but Tom Brady survives. Your whole thoughts about this whole deflate gate issue. Tom Brady, I know, is a Michigan guy. I know that you're probably a fan of him, but... No, actually, I'm not. You're not a fan of Brady? No, Good I'm not. And the reason why is you look at all of his wins, they've all come shrouded with some kind of, like... You think he's a cheater? He's a, he's a guy that's manipulating hey, the rules to hey, his advantage? Both of his, both of his losses in the Super Bowl come to one guy. You know who that guy is? It's Eli Manning. He lost to Eli Manning twice in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. I think there's something going on. You can't, you can't, every win comes surrounded by some, like, uh, there's always some whispering or in this case, this, I mean, it was blown out of proportion, mm-hmm. but I, I think he knows they're trying to bend the rules every way that they can to make it to, right. take it so, to their advantage. And, and, and so the great point is it wasn't that he was really absolved of what he did. It's that he got, the, he got off they, legally. Yeah, they couldn't they, legally prove he yeah, did they, it. And they couldn't, yeah, they couldn't show that he did it, but there's so, something happened. I mean, like you said, it makes a big difference. Go on and throw a football. See see what it does when it's overinflated or when it's underinflated. It makes a huge difference. Yeah, but the point, the question is, though, was he the one that ordered it or was oh, it the, the conditions? Because they've they, they been hey, doing scientific tests that said that, hey, just the conditions alone could have caused the abs- ball to have been. Absolutely. Just because of, like, the weather conditions, it was rainy, super cold. You know, they could have that could have taken a little bit of air out of the footballs. But, eh, like you said. Him and Belichick, they're shady. They've been shady since they've been together. Look at all the look at all the wins they got accused of recording the uh, Rams uh, practice before the Super Bowl. Like he said, I'm not buying it. He knew something. He knew something was up. Okay, put yourself in this situation. So you're an athlete. You're a guy that's you know working hard. You want a championship. Are you a guy that maybe pushes the limits and tries to do something a little uh, bit unethical uh, yeah, to get yeah. the win? Un- unfortunately, it's just the nature of the beast. You look at look at how much money is involved. You look. You know what? Everybody wants to win. It's it's hard. You get to that you get to that elite level. You you need a little edge. You've got to find something. I'm sure everybody would take it. Would I want to? No. But if I want to, if if I get to the point where I can't win a championship, I'm gonna look for a little edge. Yeah. And then you got Roger Goodell, who's like a G man. Oh. That guy's a G. Forty million a year from the owners. Yeah. And now I know he's not, he's not looked at favorably right, right now because of his his antics, but his, he, his guy, job his sh- job should totally be in question. He's had a really he's come in the league and basically just bulldozed everybody. He's been really really he's larger than life. He's taking control, running everything over, like doing everything his way. He's someone that he, he should be on the hot seat this year for his job. Now football starting up. What's your Sunday routine like? What are you doing this year? What, you what got am I on? doing Sunday? Sunday, I'm going to get up at 8 o'clock and turn every TV on that I can, watch any an, uh, analysis of fantasy football that I can, and then it's football from noon to no- to midnight. What, what's the family doing? You got two older kids? You got a wife? Yeah. Well, what are they doing? Well, I got the baby on the way. No, my, wife, my wife's awesome. I love My wife has been so cool with this situation. She's not a big fan of football, but she doesn't. She never limits me from doing what I do. So, like you said, I got Lions season tickets this year, so I get to go watch the Lions a little bit. I get to watch. I'm like you said, Sunday basically is my day. I sit down, football, bang, and that's Man, it. Man, you put money down for the Lions still? I gave that up a long time ago. No I, money. I watch it for my television. No, no, like you said, I'm buying in this year. I bought in. I bought in last year. I thought they had. I thought they had a chance. But how is it? How is it now down there at Ford Field? Fun, still fun? Yeah. Yeah. I, I I've always had a blast. I mean, we Thanksgiving is probably the best game to go down there. It is. Everybody's in a everybody's in a great mood. Everybody's drinking, having a good old time. It's I, it's a blast. All right, bro. Now to end the podcast, we'll talk a little bit about UFC. Good oh. card. I know you, me and you. You actually, I'll give you credit. You got me into the UFC. You were championing it from the early days before UFC 100 when it kind of took off. Yeah, when it blew Be- up. Before Brock Lesnar, before, you know, Randy Couture, you were into it beforehand. I, you, were, I, you were like, this, I, is, this I, is good. I was one of those guys that watched Stefan Bonner and Forrest Griffin beat the shit out of each other in the middle of the ring, and I'm like, I was instantly hooked. I want anything, any time that something was on, I remember Andre Arlovsky knocking out, um, he, he knocked somebody out in 14 seconds. It was his first pay-per-view we bought. We're like, 
what the hell? We're like, what the hell happened? <laughs> Wait, he wakes up. My man's got a gash under his eye. I'm like, oh, that's what happened. Nice. So we're gonna we're gonna probably go out to the bar tonight. Check it oh, out. Yeah. Good card tonight. What are you thinking? Yeah. What, what, thinking what's, who's, what, what, first of all, who, what's the marquee fights that the, we're, the, well, gonna the marquee, go on tonight? The marquee fight is in. He is such an underappreciated champion. Is Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson against John the Magician Dotson? Demetrius is so well-rounded. He honestly should be considered one of the best pound-for-pound fighters, if not the best in the world right now. It's just because of his weight that he doesn't get... That weight class, unfortunately, is there's not too many knockouts, so everybody's not like all up in arms about it. But that's going to be a good fight. Arlovsky and Mir is going to be an awesome fight. And then watch Rumble Johnson and uh, Jimmy Manawa. Somebody's going to sleep real, real early in that fight, and that's all I'm going to say. Dude, I love UFC nights, dude. We get out. The good thing is because the kids are sleeping. It's like 930. Yep. You, you have a good day. Then you get, get out to the out bar. Yep. Get out to the bar, watch the UFC. It's actually one of the one of the sports I like to watch at the bar. Uh, I, I'm not – like for me personally, I like to watch sports at home because yeah. you're comfortable, things like yeah. that. And plus I like the commentary. It adds a little bit of, of – like insight and and flavor into the the broadcast. It's really hard to get that audio at the bar, and you get that like rumble noise of the crowd yeah, yeah, and, crum- and the waitress yeah. is always bugging you, interrupting. You might miss something, but the UFC at the bar is just great to watch. Oh. So get out there and watch it. It's fun. You, and and people think like nowadays, you know, action sports is maybe a little too gruesome. It's not. I mean, they stop the fights typically at it, the right times uh, to, uh, to protect the uh, fighters, uh, uh, and it's exciting because boom, it's like a one or two punches, maybe one extra punch to knock the guy out. But it's just exciting, and you're like, whoa, because it comes out of the blue. It's such an exciting time. I love it. Yeah, it's a rush. You know what? They do a good job of protecting the fighters. It's a lot better. They do a lot better job of protecting the fighters than they do in boxing. So. And, and actually, and great point. I ponied up my time. <laughs> you no, not, you, no, 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 no. You, you know I didn't put no 100 bucks down. I Man. hope you did not no. watch. Oh, no. man. But I was like, I was, I got into the hype. I'm like, they're going to do it. They're going to try to bring back boxing because of the ramifications yeah. of the fight. You got Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao boring the crowd to death. And really, I think they basically, you know, really set the sport back again. Now, the heavyweights are always going to draw. Guys that, like uh, yeah. Golovkin is just outstanding. Yeah. This guy is good. These knockout artists will always draw attention to the sport. But you had a super fight, a, a, a fight that could have took that, this, the sport to the next level. That and they failed. It was a horrible. That wasn't a super fight. That fight should have happened five years ago when they were both in their prime. Like you said, Floyd's still, you know, Floyd's tactically one of the best boxers ever. But that fight should have happened five years ago. He he's he's a good businessman. Yo, <laughs> he made he made his money. Yeah, so I'd say UFC over boxing any day of the oh, week. Absolutely. Twice on Sunday. Yeah. You know it. All right, bro. You did a good job, bro. You know that was an hour? Really? It's like that. That was an hour. That was See, an that hour. Yo, know, I could do that in my sleep, man. See? I told you it's fun stuff. You want to give anybody a shout out? Tell anybody oh, out there. I, I told my daughter that if she listened, I would give her a shout out. So Sapphire Dickinson, please follow Detroit Sports podcast now that I gave you your shout out, honey. I'd like to say hi to my wife Jamie and my son Braden and my newborn on the way, Joseph. Yes, sir. Oh my gosh. That's um this guy's gonna be a dad again. Oh my God. Crazy. I can't believe you're a pops, bro. <laughs> Crazy man. This guy, like I said, we'll we'll have you back on. We gotta just share some tales of the of the crap we got into and uh, <laughs> we got into some trouble. we've gotten into some trouble. <laughs> some no Ooh. I can just give you a quick uh, to end the podcast. <laughs> You know, there's always someone out there that when you say, hey, I'm going to hang out with someone, you get the, inqu- the in- Inquisition. <laughs> I'm like, honey, Phil's Why coming. Why am I that friend? I'm that, with, I'm, I'm that friend with like three or four guys. Well, let me describe it. I'm like, honey, I'm just going to do a podcast with Phil. What time is he coming? When's he getting there? Who's he bringing? Are you going to the strip club? <laughs> Yeah. Now, why is it the strip club? I don't. I'm never the one to to bring up the strip club. Okay, so bro, I'm gonna I'm gonna lay it down. Here's 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 what happened. Here's what your boys are doing. You know, you you ask to do stuff, and sometimes the missus isn't down with it. So you you we we pull. Uh, and I, oh, maybe it's just throw, me. Throw, throw I, I pull. Under, throw I, them under the bus, sort of technique. And throw yeah exactly. So here's my here's my shtick, <laughs> honey. I don't get to spend time with Phil that much. He wants to go. What am I gonna say? <laughs> He wants to go. I don't like this. This is horrible. I don't want to go to the strip club. It's Phil. He wants to go. I, I, I don't get to see him that much. And then the wife is like, he's such a bad influence. They don't know that I'm just bullshitting. I just want to go too. <laughs> so thank you for being that guy, dog. I, I would, we're going to do this again. I hope you, yeah. you know, I, I'm glad to share it with I, you. I had a great time, man. Thanks for having me on. And I now appreciate it, you dude. have a piece of the audio world that'll live forever on uh, YouTube. That's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Four. Phil the Thriller Pamante. I'm the Doc John Macaroon. This is an episode of the Motor City Sports Rant. Thanks for downloading. Tell everybody you know. Peace. Okay.
Hey, nice idiot. Uh, f- you. Bye bye. Good day, sir. I said good day. All right. Take care now. <laughs> bye bye then. Hey, you, sir. Ha <laughs> ha